Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a special early morning edition of CAM 1105 with your host, me, Dr. White. Hi, everybody. All right, we got a lot to do, so let's get to it. All right, first of all, let me remind you, a week from the day, on the 8th of May, I will be giving test number four. You'll be downloading a password-protected PDF file from the assignment area on Monday, about 12 p.m. or earlier, right after our lecture. I will send out an email uh, with the password for test number four. You'll have until Tuesday, 1 p.m., to finish test number four and upload your answers as it's important, a single PDF file. Make sure before you upload it, you can open it. Because if I can, I can't grade it. Should take you about 40 minutes to finish test number one, four. But if you need up to two hours, take it. All right. Test number four will cover acids, bases, and organic chemistry. The test has 17 problems, nine pages, no multiple choice questions, but some questions are multiple part. And the point breakdown, 56 points on acid and bases, 49 organic chemistry, total 105, there's five, five, five bonus points. All right, now you'll need a calculator, maybe not. And on the following, by the following Wednesday, uh, by 1 p.m. or earlier, I'll post on Blackboard at that time. I hope to have it done by Tuesday evening. Uh, announcement with your test scores. I'll also email individuals your points for each answer on each problem on test four. And on Wednesday, I'll go through the answers for test number four. And that's following the uh, Monday of the 5th. Now, remember, the extra credit project, which is optional, is the deadline is a week from the day, May 8th. It's optional. No late projects will be accepted. But it's 10, 10, wait, 10, 10, I gotta get my math right, 10 bonus points. That's like getting 10 more points on a test. And if you send me your project before you upload it to uh, Blackboard, I will check to make sure it's correct. All right, another thing I want to talk about, over the weekend, I went through and graded all the labs that were in D2L, D2L wrong school, Blackboard, that were not graded. If you handed in a lab and look in the Blackboard uh, grade book and you haven't gotten points for it, email me so I can grade it and give you points for it. I'll say that again. Check your grades in Blackboard for the labs. If you have handed in a lab and it hasn't been graded, email me what lab hasn't been graded, and I'll grade it. Now, if I were in your shoes, well, I hope you have big feet. I do. <laughs> Sorry. But if I were in your shoes, I'd be asking Dr. White, what grade am I now getting in your class? Good question. Now, the following assumes you have handed in all your labs. Again, the following assumes you have handed in all of your labs.
And let's go through method number one. Method one, X equals sum of your three test scores divided by three. All right, if X is 90 or greater, you're getting an A now. Again, assuming you handed in all your labs, and any most of you did hand it in, did good on them. If X is 80 to 89, you're getting a B right now. C, 70, 79, D, 60, 69, plus center equal to 59, you're getting an F. Now, the second method where y equals let me rewrite this Since in my syllabus, one of the four tests will be dropped, you can also have Y, another method, method two, and method two is checking to make sure I have the right screen on so you can see this, is the sum, Y equals sum of the two highest of the three test score divided by two. And for method two, same thing. If Y is 90 and higher, you're getting an A right now. Again, this assumes you've handed in all your labs. If not, you got to do the longer way. B, 80, 89. C, 70, 79. D, 80, 89. And F, 59 or less. Again, both methods assume you've handed in all your labs. And that's how you find what grade you're getting. Now, speaking about grades, how can you add an extra 10 points to your, at your, one of your test scores? Do the extra credit project. Remember, it's due May 8th. And what do you have to do? A list of ionic and covalent molecules found in the ingredients of products that can be purchased. I.e., that means that is things that you could use in your, different, in your daily life. You must have five different five different molecules that have ionic bonds and it can have other bonds too, and five different molecules that only contain covalent bonds. You can use only three molecules from any one product. Well, if you got to find 10 molecules, that means you have to use at least four products. Now, should be in a table, and you should have your product name, the molecule's name, and is it ionic or covalent? It has to be on a product with an ingredients list. Bananas don't have ingredient lists, either does there.
Now, to make it interesting, you can't use gasoline, water, sodium bicarbonate, carbon dioxide, ethanol, also known as ethyl alcohol, sugar, sodium chloride, table salt, oxygen gas O2, nitrogen gas N2, natural gas methane CH4. Now, this is not a group project. Anybody I catch, and I have unfortunately in the past, not that hard for me, using, working as a group, I will consider that cheating. I will do what's in my syllabus for anybody caught cheating. You don't want that to happen, trust me. Now, before May 8th, and don't do it like Sunday night at 8, 8, 8 p.m. this week, do it. Email me your project as a PDF file or Word document. I'll check it. If anything's wrong, I'll get back to you by email and tell you how to correct it, or you have to correct it. And that way, there's no reason if you do the project, you shouldn't be able to get 10, 10, 10 bonus points. And I can't find it right now. Oh, here it is. Here's how easy it is. My favorite for the winter when I get chap lips is this. I've been using Carmex for years. If you look on the ingredients label, one of them is phenol. And phenol is a covalent molecule. So you would write down Carmex, phenol, covalent. You can use that. And there are two more you can get from here too. I'm not gonna tell. Oops. And you should consider doing that. So don't forget, this is due May 8th. By the end of the day, no late projects accepted. And it's easy, 10, 10, 10 bonus points, like getting 10 more points on a test. Now, as I look at the clock, this will be a good time to take about a five minute break. We'll come back and we'll continue. I'm gonna go through the acid-based problems at chapter seven.
Time to get back to work. All right, let's, let me make sure you can see this. And you can. In the last couple months, it's a new feature Zoom has added. Before I'd have to ask students, can you see it? All right, let's go through chapter seven, practice problems. Remember, you should do these on your own. So you do good on test number four. And the first one, what is an acid for bronze glory theories of acids and bases? It's a proton, or you could have written down H plus donor. Acid, proton donor. What is a bronze base for bronze glory theory of acids and bases? And a base is a proton acceptor, H plus. Now, you should be able to the list we went through in class to identify something as an acid, a base, or a salt. And first one, AHCl, acid. Next one, NaOH, potassium sodium hydroxide, base. C, NaCl, salt. D, H2SO4, sulfuric acid, acid. E, NH3, it's a base, and F, HNO3, acid. Now, if the PA of a solution has a hydronium ion concentration, bracket, H3O plus, close bracket, hydronium ion concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the minus third, what is the pH of solution? And is it acidic, basic, or neutral? Now, if you look on the screen, important information, test number four. If the pH, the pH is minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration, H3O plus. If the hydronium ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus X, pH is X. And I don't think you saw that, so let's go through that again. Again, important information, test four. pH minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration, H3O plus. If H3O plus is the concentration of 1.0 times to the minus X, then the pH is X. This is my special gift to you. Therefore, here we, what are we trying to find? pH, what are we given? Hydronium ion concentration pH minus the log of H3O plus, we put in that value, 1.0 times 10 to the minus X. Therefore, the pH is X, three. Now, is this acidic, basic, or neutral? You should know. And let me get to my whiteboard. P 
pH goes from 0 to 14. At 7, this is neutral pH, neutral solution. Remember, neutral hydronium equals hydroxide concentration. Below 7, it's acidic. Above 7, it's basic. And most of the time, you'll see alkaline. But I like for this class using the term basic. So what was the pH? 3. It's below 7. That means that solution was acidic. Hold on one second. I just heard something. I want to check. Sorry, something fell over. I had to place it on the side, and that's what I heard. All right, let's go to number six. If the solution has a hydronium ion concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 12, what is the pH of the solution? <clears throat> Excuse me. And is it acidic, basic, or neutral? Trying to find pH. We're given the hydronium ion concentration. pH, as you know, important information. Test number four, minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. Put that in. If the H3O plus is 1.0 times 10 to the minus X, the pH is X. In this case, pH is X is uh, 12. And is that acidic, neutral, or basic? And when the pH is greater than 7, 12 is, it's basic. All right, let's look at number 7. If the hydroxide ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3, what is the pH of the solution? Is it acidic, basic, or neutral? We're trying to find pH. But we're not given the pH is minus the log of the hydronium concentration. Uh-oh, we only have the hydroxide. 1.0, hydroxide OH minus concentration. 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3. What do we do? Well, if you look at important information, KW, yay, not named after me, but I wish it was, the ionization of constant water is the hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide equal one, that should really be 1.0. times 10 to the minus 14. You'll be given this. Therefore, you need two steps. Yes, two steps. And the first step, you will take the hydroxide ion concentration and calculate the hydronium ion concentration. How do you do that? From KW, yay, that's not me, but I wish it was, H3O plus times the hydroxide concentration OH minus equal 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. We're trying to get hydronium ion concentration alone on one side. Anything divided by itself is number one. It's gone, cancel out. So I divide this side by hydroxide concentration. Whatever I do on one side, I have to do on the other, and I did. And anything divided by itself is number one, so this becomes hydronium ion concentration equal 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by hydroxide. Put those numbers in, calculate, you get 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11 is the hydronium ion concentration, H3O plus. 
are we done? No, we're trying to get pH. And therefore, we do step two hydronium ion concentration used to calculate pH. And again, pH is minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. And what is that? Well, it's 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11. When it's 10.0 times 10 to the minus X, the pH is X. In this case, X is 11. Is that neutral, acidic, or basic? Remember, you should know. Uh-oh, I better be subtle. And know this, you should know this pH scale goes from zero to 14. At seven, you have pH neutral, below seven, it's acidic, above seven, it's basic. Sometimes called alkaline, but in my class, I'll use basic. And the pH was 11, above seven, that solution is basic. And number eight is the same way, given the hydroxide, you have to calculate first step hydronium using the KW right here, solve for hydronium is this, I ran out of space, and it's this, 1.0 times 10 to the minus seven. Put the pH minus the log of hydronium, put that in, when it's 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7, when x to 1.0 times 10 to the minus x, pH is x, this case 7. And pH 7 is neutral solution. All right, let's look at what happens, and this is important, to the numerical value of pH of water beaker of water at 7.0 pH if you add a few drops of concentrated NaOH solution. Well, you have to know NaOH is a base. When you add a base, the pH increases, goes closer to 14. Now in B, what happens to the pH of that same beaker of water if you added a few drops of concentrated H2SO4 solution. You need to know H2SO4, that's an acid. And an acid decreases the pH. When you add an acid, it becomes more acidic, but I'm asking what happens to the numerical value it goes down, decreases. If you add a base, what happens to the numerical value when it gets basic? The pH goes up. And those are things you should know. And you see it? Even says on here, know this. All right. Now, what happens to the numerical value of a pH of a beaker of a buffer solution if you add a, a few drops of a dilute acidic acid solution. By definition, a buffer, see the little arrow, look at buffer. A buffer solution resists the change in pH if you add a small amount of acid or base. And dilute acid is a small amount and the pH stays the same. What happens to that same buffer solution if you add a few drops of base? Well, it's dilute base, and a buffer solution resists change in pH if you add a small amount of an acid or base. Therefore, for B, same answer. pH stays the same. 
Now, let's look at 12. If you have to add 1.35 times 10 to the third milliliters of a 1.35 capital M molar and AOA solution to neutralize, that's the key word, 1.87 times 10 squared milliliters of an aqueous HCl solution, what is the molarity of the HCl solution? We're trying to find molarity of HCl. We're given how many milliliters of the 1.53 NaOH solution molarity solution. And that's used to uh, neutralize 1.87 times 10 squared milliliters of HCl. Well, what do I do? I look at important information, test number four at neutralization. This is a titration. And you'll do one tomorrow in the lab I'll talk about. Moles of acid equal moles of base. And because of that, and I gave you this formula, when you're using a monoprotic base and acid, which in this class we will, milliliters of acid times the molarity of acid equal milliliters of base times molarity of base. So this is given to you for test four. So at neutralization, moles of base equal moles of acid. The milliliters of base times the molarity of base equal mol milliliters of acid times the molarity of acid. Now, NaOH is a base. Therefore, we put in 1.35 times 10 third milliliters and 1.35 capital M NaOH. HCl, hydrochloric acid, is an acid. We put in the acid. We're trying to find the molarity. How do you get that alone on one side? You divide by 1.87 times 10 squared milliliters. Anything divided by itself is the number one. Whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. Milliliters cancel out, 1.87. You're left with molarity of HCl and these numbers. You do the math, notice milliliters divided by milliliters cancel out, we're left with molarity, which is a unit, it would be an HCl, because that's what we're trying, but molarity. And those are all three significant figures, and you get 11.0 molar HCl. Now, if you use scientific notation, that'd be 1.10, three significant figures, times 10 to the one. Let's look at 14. If you have to add 358 milliliters of a 5.67 capital M HNO3 nitric acid solution to neutralize 358 milliliters of an aqueous KOH potassium hydroxide base solution, what is the molarity of the solution? Again, the key word, neutralize. And if you look at test number four, important information in the back, we'll have at neutralization, moles of acid equal moles of base. Moles of acid is milliliters of acid times molarity of acid. Milliliters of base equal, or molar, bleh, Moles of base is milliliters of base times molarity of base. So the key thing at neutralization, this. So we're trying to find molarity, capital M, KOH. It's a base. You should know that. We're given milliliters of that base. We're given 358 milliliters of a 5.67 capital M HNO3, nitric acid. 
you should know that is an acid. At neutralization, moles of acid equal moles of base. And that can be broken down, which I, being real nice, don't tell anybody I'm being nice. Shh, don't tell anybody I'm helping you out. At neutralization, again, moles of acid, moles of base, milliliters of acid times molarity of acid, milliliters of base times molarity of acid, base. Put in the numbers. Remember, we're trying to find mol molarity of KOH, the base. We want it alone on one side. So therefore, I'm going to divide this side by 358 milliliters of KOH, which I also do on this side. And they cancel out. We're left molarity KOH equal this times this times this. I rewrite it this way. Three, three, three significant figures. Uh oh, he's in his run again. And the answer three significant figures. Because when you multiply and divide in a mathematical operation, You get the same number of significant figures in your answer as the number that has the fewest significant figures. 358, three significant figures, 5.67, three significant figures, and five, 358, three significant figures. And the number you get is three significant figures. And once again, this will not be given an important information, test number four, but you should know the pH scale. Of all the things I'll teach you, this is probably one of the most important this semester that you'll use for the rest of your life. When pH is at seven, I wiped out too much. When it's at seven, it's neutral pH. When it's below seven, it's acidic. When it's above seven, it's basic. The closer to zero you get, the more acidic. The closer to base you get, the more, the 14, the more basic you get. Now, one thing, I don't know if I mentioned it, but Let me log out of this. And if you look on the screen right now, you'll see the pH scale. And notice it has colors. And that corresponds to what's called pH paper. That's why they have those colors there. But when you're below 7, you're acidic. Now, Lemon juice and limes are acidic too. What's the pH of limes? pH of lime juice is about two to three, which makes it Acidic. Lemons and limes, and also tomatoes, for that matter, are tart, more lemons and limes, because they're very acidic. Mother Nature has set up in our brain with our tongue, or whoever did that, things that are acidic taste sour. That sour taste. 
if you ever bitten a lemon, ooh, is that sour? Well, that's because the pH is so low, it has what's called citric acid. Same thing with limes. Now, if you've ever had canker sores and have ketchup or tomato sauce, you have stuff that's acidic in there. Tomatoes are acidic. Ketchup has vinegar in it. Vinegar is acetic acid in water. It's acidic. And that's why it hurts in your mouth because the acid present. Now, these are weak acids, low acetic acid in vinegar or the citric acid in lemons and limes. If you had HCl, hydrochloric acid, you'd be in a hospital or dead. Don't do that, please, ever. And again, pH of vinegar, which is very acidic, is also two to three. And that's something you should know. Now, let's go back to that chart again. If you notice, all the way at the end, they have gastric acid, pH one. What is that? One of the great miracles of life for me is I have in my stomach and you have in your stomach cells that make hydrochloric acid. Now, hydrochloric acid is an acid, and that's why the pH is about one, very acidic. And that helps down your, break down your food. But for Chem 1105, what is the reason the liquid in your stomach is acidic or pH below seven? Pick my hair there. That's because there's an acid present, hydrochloric acid. I'm always amazed that my body and yours makes that. All right. With that, I better open up All right, time to get back to my favorite part of the semester because Dr. White is an organic chemist and that's organic chemistry. And last week, I started talking about the many chapters I've combined for organic chemistry. And here are the chapters we're covering. And remember, Organic chemistry is based on the carbon atom. And organic chemistry was originally molecules that came from things that were alive. That's how the term organic came about for this type of chemistry. Now, carbon has four valence electrons and it can bond to itself to form chains. We call them chains because the carbon atoms are bonded or linked together like a chain. And it can have branches or rings. Now I asked you to learn what is a hydrocarbon. Subtle time. You should know if I ask on test, what is a hydrocarbon molecule? Those are molecules with only carbon and hydrogen atoms. 
Now, there are two types of hydrocarbons. Again, I'll be subtle. Can't know this. The first type is a saturated hydrocarbon. Because it's a hydrocarbon, it's a molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms. And because it's a saturated hydrocarbon, all, and this is important, not any bond, but all carbon carbon bonds are single bonds. One pair of electron being shared between the two carbons. And we show a single bond. In organic chemistry, we don't use Lewis structures, a line. Each line is a pair of electrons. And this is a carbon-carbon single bond. Now, the other one you should know is what is an unsaturated hydrocarbon. And because it's a hydrocarbon, it's a molecule with only carbon and hydrogen atoms, but the unsaturated, and that un is important, means that contains one or more carbon-carbon multiple bond, a double bond, or a triple bond. That's a double bond. And this is a triple bond. And you should know this. Now, how do you draw organic molecules? Now, the important thing to remember is there's always four, 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 bonds to carbon. One, two, three, four. four oh, I got to get this finger fixed. Four, four bonds to carbon. Always. If they're not, the remainder are made up by hydrogen atoms. And let's look how to can draw condensed structures. Show the atoms are connected, but does not show carbon-carbon. Now, I, even though the book says this, I still show carbon-carbon single bond. Now, in this class, we won't use parentheses, but I thought I'd teach you about it. Let's look how to do that. This is propane. How do you draw it? Well, I have my three carbons that are in propane. Now there's always four bonds to carbon. Therefore, this first carbon has one bond, but there should be four bonds. So four minus one equals three. And now it has three hydrogens. And that's how we write it. The second carbon. How many bonds to it? One, two. And there should always be four bonds to carbon. Four minus two equal two. So this will have two hydrogens. And finally, the last carbon here with the three dots, how many bonds does it have? One bond. There should be four bonds to carbon four minus one, three, so it has three hydrogens. Now you could have written it this way. I write the lines, the, the dash there, or my carbons start going toward the bottom of the page, which is not good. That helps keep it straight for me. Now this is a small enough molecule. You could also write it this way. If I ask, write propane, well, I'll write the molecule, put in the hydrogens, this is how you do it.
This molecule is butane. It's the molecule that's liquid in those little lighters. Cigarette and other. I hope you gave up smoking. Dr. White was a heavy smoker. I gave my smoking up many decades ago. Thank God, or I'd be dead by now. Why don't you put in the hydrogens in butane? Your turn. Remember, there's always four bonds to carbon. Always. Oops. Uh, always four bonds to carbon. So your turn to put in the hydrogens. Don't forget, you're supposed to be putting the hydrogen some butane. There's four bonds to carbon. If there aren't, you replace it with hydrogens. All right, let's do it. The first carbon, how many bonds? One. There should always be four bonds. Four minus one equal three. So this carbon let me do something. Hold on. I didn't give myself enough room. There, now I have a, this first carbon has one bond and four minus one is three. So it has three hydrogen. The second carbon has one, two bonds. And there should always be four bonds to carbon. Four minus two equal two. And that means it has two hydrogen. And this third carbon, has, let me clean up something first. Has this bond and this bond. Two bonds suit already, but carbon should always have four bonds and four minus two is two. So it should have H2. And finally, this third carbon has this one bond to it. Carbon should always have four. Four minus one is three. So it has three hydrogen. And let me show you that. And that's butane. And you should be able to put in the hydrogens here if you can't have a molecule that doesn't. Oh, let's do one more.
And let's see one more example. This is octane. You don't have to know the name, but that's a major component in gas. That's where they got the octane numbers from. But your job right now is to put in the hydrogens in octane. Go, <laughs> go. Remember, put in the hydrogens in an octane. Give you another minute. Again, put in the hydrogens and octane. Remember, there's four bonds to carbon. Four, four, four bonds to carbon. All right, let's get to work. First carbon, one bond. Four bonds to carbon, always only one bond. The remainder are hydrogens. Second carbon, two bonds. There should always be four bonds to carbon. I have two bonds to that carbon. That means I'll have two hydrogens. The next one is the same. 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 And so is this. Now, let's look at this last one. There's one bond to carbon, you see. There should always be four bonds. Four minus one is three. So I have three hydrogens. And this is octane. And a molecule octane or isomer, which I'll talk about later, is in gasoline. And when they first had gasoline, the gasoline with the highest amount of octane was the best. This is back about 1905 for making the car engine run smoothly. You know, some of the original car engines. And that's where someone developed octane number. All right, now, unlike or inorganic molecules we've talked about so far, Organic molecules, carbon, can be cyclic. I think everybody knows what a bicycle is. Bi means two, cycle, rings, around. And a bicycle has two, two wheels. Well, in organic chemistry, we have what's known as cycloalkanes. Now, an alkane is a saturated hydrocarbon, cyclo, the prefix, means it's a ring. And how do we do that? It's represented by polygons. Poly means many, gons mean objects, many-sided drawing. And the rule is each bend in a line is a carbon atom, each end of a line is a carbon atom. Now, I don't use the end of the line in this class, but at my level we do. And each intersection of the line is a carbon atoms. Now, when you're using the line method, 
hydrogen atoms are not shown. So let's look at cycloalkanes. Now, if I had six carbons, and this is not the line method. This is one of the few times you'll ever see me drawing a ring with the hydrogens. And it's got one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm showing uh, hydrogens because, oops, there's two bonds to carbon, four bonds to carbon. Each carbon in a ring in this ring has two hydrogen. Now, how we really draw this is like this. This has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons or six thens. By the way, this is called cyclo. Hexane. And this is how you should be able to know how many carbons in this structure. Well, you count the bends, and there's six carbon atoms. Next, a five membered ring. You draw a pentagon. I always think of these look like the little green houses in Monopoly. How many carbons in this ring? Count the bends. One, two, three, four, five. This has five carbons. And this is called cyclopentane. You don't have to know the name. And cyclopentane has five carbons. Now, both cyclohexane and cyclopentane, someone who's not an organic chemist would say, well, this is a hexagon, this is a pentagon, but we call these both rings. Even though they're not a cycle like a circle, we still call them a ring. Now, another ring would be, oops. Would be this. And you'd call it a square. No, I'm an organic chemist. This is a ring. And how many carbons are in that ring? Your turn. And the answer is, every bend in a line is a carbon. One, two, three, four. You call that a square? No, it's a ring. It has four carbons. In penicillin, you have a ring with carbons and a other atom. I think it's a sulfur. And that's part of the penicillin molecule that helps save lives. Now, one more, two more rings. How many carbons in this ring? You, I call that a ring. You're going to say, no, it's a triangle. This is organic chemistry. That's a ring. How many carbons in that ring? And this is called cyclopropane. You don't need to know the name, but I'll tell you it anyways. How many carbons in cyclopropane? Remember, every bend in a line is a carbon.
And the answer is one, two, three bends. Therefore, this has three carbons. Just to remind you, every bend in a line is a carbon. This is one of the rare times I'll show a ring with carbons in it. We'd never write this. We well, could, but organic chemists don't. We write it using the line method. And one more ring, which is in our, not in our daily life, but I thought I'd draw it. And this is cyclooctane. It has one, two, three. This bend is in set four, five, six, seven, eight. Let me see if I can do a better one. Sort of better. Let's take a look at Wikipedia to see a nice cyclooctane ring. And here's a nicer one, way nicer. And notice there's one. Let me make sure you're really seeing this. And the answer is you are. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, I'm an organic chemist. And when I come, when I'm driving, I come to a certain place where I have to stop. How do I know that? Because there's a stop sign there. And every time I come to a stop sign, I think of cyclooctane. Because it's an eight-membered ring, the octagon. So when I'm driving and I come to the stop sign, my brain pops in, oh, cyclooctane. Now, a skill you should have with structures, besides putting in the hydrogens, Oops, wrong color. And let's look at this, and we'll come back after break in a little while and do some more. How many carbon atoms are in the following? Well, the first one, count to C. One, two, three, four, five. Five atoms. In B, it's a ring. Count every bend in a line as a carbon. One, two, three, four, five. Six. On my test, I use software to draw rings and it'll look nicer. And this has six carbons. And I'm going to sneeze, I think. <coughs> Excuse me, I did sneeze. Now, if I look at the clock, let's take a five minute break, five minutes, and I'll see you in five. I'm going to get up and stretch.
let's get back to work. During my break, I was just thinking, oh, I should have done some more examples of this type of problem, put in the hydrocarbon atoms. So let's do a couple more, and then we'll go back to how many carbons. Well, so used to putting them in, I was drawing a structure without them in. All right, your turn. Draw in the hydrogens for A and B. Remember, there are always four bonds to carbon. And if they're not, the remainder are hydrogens. Your turn now. Let's do A and then we'll do B. A, put in the hydrogens in A. Again, just for A, put in the hydrants. Remember, there's always four, <clears throat> excuse me, four bonds to carbon. Give you another 20 seconds, put in the hydrogens in A, and then we'll do B. All right, let's look at A. This first carbon has one bond to it right there. There should always be four bonds to carbon. So four minus one equals three. This carbon also has one bond to it. And again, there should always be four bonds to carbon, four minus one, the remainder are three. Same thing with this carbon over here. And it has one bond to it. There should be four bonds. Four minus one is three. So it has three hydrogens. Now let's get to a tricky one. We look at this carbon, which I have the red dot. How many bonds to that? One, two, three. So. There should always be four bonds to carbon. Four minus three equals one. So there's one hydrogen there. This should be H2. Oop. 
come back. There's the heart carbon. All right, let's look at the spinal carbon in A. How many bonds to it? One line here, one there. That's two bonds. There should always be, oop, I made a mistake. That should be a one. There you go. I have it right here. I was looking at the next carbon. Now this carbon right here with the red dot has one, two bonds to it. There should always be four bonds to carbon. The remainder are made up by hydrogen. Four minus two is two. This one had the H2. So CH3, CH, CH3, CH3, CH2. Now, your turn to try B. Put in all the hydrants in B. Go. Remember, put in the hydrants in B for each carbon atom, and there are always four bonds to carbon. Your turn. All right, while you're doing that, I went and got a fresh bottle of water from my refrigerator, and let's do this. Remember, there's always four bonds to carbon, always. So if we look at this first carbon here, there's one bond, four minus one is three, so I'll put three hydrogens there. This carbon, this carbon, this carbon, this carbon all have one bond to it. So I can put in my three hydrogens on each one. And we're left with two carbons to go. Let's look at this carbon. How many bonds to it? One, two, three, four. There's always four bonds to carbon. Well, there are four minus four equals zero. Therefore, I don't put any hydrogens there. And we have one less carbon to do. To go. Oops. Got to be careful with this eraser on my tablet. All right. And that one less carbon to go is this one. How many bonds to that carbon? Well, count the lines. One, two, three. There should always be four bonds to carbon. That carbon has three, four minus three, one. So it gets one hydrogen. Oops. <laughs> I'm so used to writing CH3, and there it is. So the way to draw this with all the hydrogens,
And this is an example of a branch hydrocarbon. And same thing here, it's like trees with branches coming off from the trunk. All right, now let's go back to how many carbons. I thought I'd go back. Your turn, how many carbon atoms are in that molecule? Cyclopentane, I just gave it away, all right. Every bend in a line is a carbon. Your turn. All right, how many bends in a line? One, two, three, four, five. So there are five carbons. Or carbon atoms in A. Let's do another one. How many carbon atoms are in B? Your turn. Again, how many carbon atoms are in B? Every bend in a line is a carbon. And for you, those of you watching on YouTube, you can hit the pause button if you need more time. All right, let's count the number of carbons in B. Well, I have a ring. Every bend in a line is a carbon. One, two, this right here is two, three, four, five, six. So the ring has six carbons, but I have two more here, seven, eight, two of them. Six plus two equal eight. There are eight carbon. Oh, let's do one more. These are fun. In C, how many carbon atoms are in the molecule in C? Your turn. Remember, every bend in a line is carbon, plus if you see one, they're there too. All right, let's count them. Well, I've got a ring. No, that's not a square, that's a ring. How many carbon atoms? Every bend in a line is a carbon. One, two, three, four. So I have four carbons in the ring. 
This is called a methyl group, and that's one carbon. This is called an isopropyl, one, two, three, plus three. So four plus one is five, plus three, that's eight carbons. Now let's do that in red. One, two, three, four. I'll call this number five, six, seven, eight. And that has eight carbons. And this is a skill you should know. Ten. Big N. Now, it turns out in organic chemistry, we have what's called functional groups. And functional groups are specific grouping of atoms in a molecule. And the reason this is important, functional groups have the same, undergo the same type of chemical reactions. No matter what kind of structure you're in, 99% of the time there are exceptions. That functional group, if it's in molecule A or B, will always react the same way. And a lot of functional groups have similar physical properties too. Now, I'm not going to ask you to learn the name of functional groups, but let's look at some key ones right here. Now, there's a double bond. Oops, wrong color. That should have been red, not red. Now, double bond, you see by two lines through carbon. Triple bond is this. An alcohol is a carbon with a OH group. This is called an alcohol. You've heard of alcoholic beverages, the molecule in beer, wine, and uh, hard liquor is ethanol. That's the, or ethyl alcohol, it's also called. And hydroxyl group, OH on a carbon, that's an alcohol. And ethanol is so widely used, it's also just given the name alcohol. Now, if you go to a gas station, look by the gas pump, there'll be a sign, this gasoline contains up to 10% ethanol. Do not drink gasoline to get inebriated. It will get you very sick or in dead. But... There are different types of alcohols. Now, an aldehyde is a molecule with carbons attached to carbon double bond to oxygen with a hydrogen. Dr. White loves aldehydes and ketones too. My PhD thesis dealt with aldehydes and ketones. A ketone is a carbon double bond to oxygen attached to two other carbon atoms. Now, you can have other things attached here. Now, a carboxylic acid, carbon, and the carboxylic acid is this right here. And I'll slip to an ester. And this is an ester. And all your flowers you smell you're smelling mainly because of esters. And most of your fruits and vegetables come from esters. Now, amines, which I worked in for many decades, oops, is a molecule. R means something with carbons in organic chemistry, just like X, Y, and Z. And that's a quaternary ammonium salt or amine. And a quaternary ammonium salt R is something with carbons in it. X is a halogen anion. 
there can be other This is a quaternary ammonium salt. These R groups can be different. We show that by primes. And quaternary ammonium salts are important for what? Your fabric softener. All fabric softeners are quaternary ammonium salts. Also key antimicrobial compounds that kill bad things. Microbes are quaternary ammonium salts. Amides are another functional group. Now, if you are taking, when I teach Chem 1212 here at COD, which I'm not obviously this semester, I'm teaching 1105, that's a one semester organic, and you learn all about functional groups. But for this class, I'm going to ask you to be able to just locate a functional group in a molecule. How do you find a functional group? You should know how to find a functional group. Look for anything that's not a carbon atom, that's not a hydrogen or carbon-carbon single bond, and it should get your attention like this. Can I get your attention? All right. So let's look at this important skill you should know how to do. Two points each. Circle the functional group or groups. There could be more than one in the following. I'll do a couple. Then I'm going to share the fun and let you try some. And if we look at A, look for what's different. What's not carbon? What's not a hydrogen? What's not a carbon-carbon single bond? It's going to be a functional group. Oh, look, oxygen, that's not carbon or hydrogen. With a hydrogen and a carbon, and that's my functional group. The functional group will always contain a, I don't know my, why my circle didn't stay with me. Hold on. Let's try that again. And there's your functional group. By the way, that's an alcohol. All right, let's do another one. And the question is, circle the functional groups in the following two points each. And how do you do that? You look for what's different. Well, it's not a carbon-carbon single bond or a carbon or hydrogen atom to get your attention like that. Hopefully that's it. Oh, look, an oxygen to this carbon, and that's an aldehyde with a hydrogen. Oh, look, a carbon-carbon double bond. How do we know that? The two lines, and that's the other functional group. And here's one for you to try. Circle the functional groups, two points each for A, B, C, and D. And there might be more than one or only one. Your turn.
I'm going to red pen for this. All right, my turn. If you need more time, hit pause if you're watching this on YouTube. All right, let's go. Ooh, what's different? How do you find a functional group? What's well, not carbon atom? What's well, not a hydrogen atom? What's well, not a carbon carbon single bond? Should get to your attention like that. Ooh, a nitrogen with hydrogens on this carbon. That's called an amine. Ooh, an oxygen double bond to carbon here. This turns out to be a ketone. I'm not asking to learn that. Ooh, let's do one more, have some real fun. And why don't you circle the functional groups in D? Remember, look for what's different. What's well, not carbon? What's well, not a hydrogen atom? What's well, not a carbon carbon single bond? Should get your attention like this. Time's up. All right, let's look for the functional groups. Oop, wrong color. Look for what's different. Ooh, an oxygen. What's well, not carbon? What's well, not hydrogen? What's well, not a carbon carbon single bond? And this is an alcohol. Remember, there's a carbon here. Ooh, another two oxygens with a hydrogen on this to the same carbon. This is a carboxylic acid. I'm not asking to learn the names, but I do, so I'll tell you. And finally, oh, look right here. Two lines between two carbons, and this is a double bond. So there are three functional groups in this molecule. Again, look for what's different. What's well, not carbon? What's well, not hydrogen? What's well, not a carbon-carbon single bond? should get your attention like this. Well, being an organic chemist, I've worked in the real world. I did for many decades as senior research and development manager for a number of chemical companies, organic chemical companies. Let's find out, why is this interesting? And it is. Now, if you look at your screen right now, you'll see from Wikipedia, and by the way, Wikipedia has been so heavily policed by our chemists, and especially organic chemists like me, I have the credentials that they will make a change when I've asked for it. And it's been a long time since I've seen a mistake. So anything to do with chemistry, especially organic chemistry on Wikipedia is accurate. Other things I don't know about, but that. This is beta carotene. If you look at that molecule, every bend in a line is a carbon, every end in a line is a carbon, and the two lines means double bond. It's got a lot of double bonds. And why am I showing you beta carotene? This is the molecule that gives carrots its orange color. This molecule absorbs all the light, white light, except the colors that make up orange, which are reflected. Now, this molecule breaks down in your body. Your body has a way of breaking it down to another molecule called retinal.
And here's retinal, it's got an aldehyde, double bonds and a ring. And this molecule helps retinal. It's got its common name from your eye, the retina, retina in your eye. And it helps do something. <laughs> Dr. White is not a medical doctor or an eye surgeon. Oh, time out for a personal thing. Over a year and a half ago now, that long, if you look at my old videos on YouTube, you'll see me wearing glasses. Well, I had eye surgery. What kind? I had cataracts, not my retina. Luckily, not that, but cataracts. And if you ever need a good eye surgeon, he's located in Hoffman Estates. I highly recommend Dr. Cabin. Email me if you need contact information. Uh, did a great job on my eyes. So let's look at another molecule now that you know what these structures mean. Now your hormones are organic molecules. And one hormone, otherwise known as your steroids, are this molecule. This is testosterone. And testosterone has a lot of functional groups. And these are rings that are fused together. Six, 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 five. And every bendinal are these wedges, end the line, show methyl groups, the carbon. These are hydrogens. Notice I have a ketone double bond alcohol. How this molecule works in my body or yours, I have no idea. I know how the chemistry of it, but not how it interacts in your body. But this is a hormone. Now, another hormone is this molecule. And it's similar, but not the same, different to testosterone. And this is the female hormone that regulates a woman's monthly cycle, depending, and now I'm going way beyond my knowledge of the human body, depending how much testosterone, I'm not testosterone, the wrong one, pro, uh, estradiol you have in your body, your body's making, regulates a woman's monthly cycle, what it should be doing. And this has the same four rings fused together in the molecule of the hormone. But there are double bonds in this ring, alcohol, not a ketone, alcohol up here. Oh, let's do one more steroid. And this is a really complex molecule, but it has that same four rings. This is cortisone. And cortisone is an important molecule to help you from itching. And again, it's a steroid, and there are many other steroids. Now, again, it has the four ring system. <clears throat> I won't ask this on a test, but I thought I'd point it out. And all hormones, all your steroids, have the same ring skeleton. And all hormones have this ring skeleton. By the way, the six is called ring A, the six ring B, this is C, and that's D. 
I never worked with steroids in a chemistry lab because the kind of chemistry I did was different. But it's an important part of our drugs and other things we use in our daily life. So you should know how to look for functional groups. And we did our functional group practice time. Now, I thought I'd show you one interesting uh, functional group, and that's a thiol. A thiol is like an alcohol, but R means carbons, has an H, H group. And the important thing about thiols is they stink. Oh, do they stink. And the old IUPAC, IUPAC is an organization that was set up in 1918, 1920, right after World War I, that is in Geneva, Switzerland, that came up with the rules we now use for naming chemicals, especially organic. And the old one is Mercaptan, and I still use it, because they made that change in 1980-ish, which I was using. Now, thiols. Thiols, important thing, you can smell a gas leak in your house because T-butyl thiol was added to natural gas to make it smell. How smelly are thiols? There's one part of T-butyl thiol per billion, per I think one to four parts per billion parts of natural gas, methane. What this means is for every billion pounds of natural gas, they only have to put in about one to four pounds of T-butyl thiol to make it stink. Now, something I like, but some people don't, onions and garlic stink or have their characteristic odor due to thiols. Now, what's the stinkiest thing you can think of? Let's say that five times quickly. And that's a skunk. And a skunk is made up mainly of some water and these two molecules. Notice sulfur, hydrogen, and a carbon thiol. Sulfur on a carbon thiol. Have you ever been by where an animal has been skunked or skunked to slut and loose? You know how stinky it can be. Let's see if I can find something. All right, on your screen, something very sad happened in Texas back in 1937. And that was the New London School blew up and it killed more than 300 students and teachers. And there are two stories, but the main one was that they had nearby an oil well field that had waste methane, natural gas. And the company ran that says, we'll pipe it over to your school and we'll give it to you free. It was normally back then they'd burn it off. Well, whoever did the piping for the gas line in that high school or school, I think it was a high school, total grammar school, high school together, did a bad job. And back then natural gas did not have a thiol put it in there. And because it was leaking gas, natural gas, you couldn't smell it. And natural gas can blow up. All you need, you can see right here, let's see right there, you can barely see it, the switch for my lights in this room. Any light switch, you go click, there's a little spark that goes on in there. I've worked in areas where in a chemical plant, we use hydrogen, which is really explosive. They have special explosion proofs switches, and even telephones. And you don't use your cell phone there because you could blow up the place. Well, somebody turned on a switch and a that or a 
electrical device, like in the shop, wood shop, a drill or something, you'll see a spark and it blew the place up. And because of that, over 300 children and uh, teachers were killed. A lot more were badly burned. And the, there's a picture of it. It was pretty brand new school too. And like I said, they had the gas heaters throughout the building. And because of that, Texas government set up a, a independent study and they came up with the idea to add thiols to that natural gas so because of that tragedy, and you should know, you can smell a gas leak because there's a real stinky compound, T-butyl in there. Now, if I look at what we're into, I think this would be a good time to end today's longer lecture. All right. Remember, a week from today will be test four. Tomorrow, I'll finish up the organic material. On Wednesday, I will do the review for test four, which is a week from today. And I'll also go through the organic on, oh, excuse me, Wednesday problem set. Remember, the lab you did last week is due tomorrow. And don't forget, we'll do the new lab tomorrow. And on Tuesday and Wednesday at 6 to 7.15, I have my office hours. So if you need any help, come on by. Or tomorrow or Wednesday after lecture, like here, I'll stick around with Zoom for a little while if you need any help. With that, I'll say, gang gazon, goodbye. Stole that from Beverly Hillbilly's granny, goodbye. Gang gazon.